Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Pastor Shane Claiborne is a preacher, a teacher, a writer, and a blacksmith. On Sundays, he preaches, and on Mondays, you can find him hammering at the forge as he beats guns into garden tools. Shane believes that we should all be beating guns into shovels. Instead of arming our nation for a war against itself, and instead of lamenting one more mass murdering, like in Chesapeake, Virginia this week, in Walmart, when a supervisor killed six of his colleagues in the break room before turning the gun on himself, or like Club Q nightclub just eight nights ago in a place where the gay community found safety and laughter and friendship and love in Colorado Springs until five people were murdered and 19 injured by a hate-filled gunman, or like the University of Virginia, where three Virginia football players were murdered by a former teammate in a parking garage after coming home from watching a play in Washington, D.C. just 12 days ago. Pastor Claiborne knows, and he practices what he preaches. He beats guns into garden tools. Now, this is no modest dream in the most gun-owning nation on earth, where one thought where one would have not even turned a, or batted an eyelash to a TV show cowboy named Roy Rogers, who named his dog Bullet and his horse Trigger. Our gun-owning households often have not one gun, but an arsenal, and our culture is deeply invested in the idea that guns are a solution, not a problem. Into the arsenal walks Claiborne and his blacksmithing friends. Shane asked people to surrender their weapons for mass destruction, turning every caliber of firepower into a gardening tool or a monument for the town where he is. Shane is an evangelical Christian who believes that this is what Jesus would do. He says, people say we don't have a gun problem, we just have a heart problem. Well, we've come to realize we have a gun problem and a heart problem. God heals hearts and people change laws that hurt them because of guns. I grew up in Tennessee, he continues, talking about being pro-life. But I began to see how narrowly we had defined that in my community, where you can be pro-life as long as you're only anti-abortion. You can't be pro-life and be against the death penalty or pro-war. You can't be that and call yourself pro-life. So he says, I really wanted to be more consistent about my own advocacy for life. And when it comes to guns, he continues, we evangelical Christians, particularly white evangelicals, own guns at a higher rate than anyone in America. That became really troubling to me that the folks who are worshiping the Prince of Peace are packing heat more than anybody else. Shane continues, it's hard to put into words what happens at the forge when we gather round the fire at the forge and speak of it as a symbol of the Spirit of God. As you move the metal toward the fire, it begins to take on a character of the fire, and it glows, and it softens. We believe that that should transform us as people to care about one another more. Shane talks about Democrats and Republicans, police chiefs and officers, gang members coming together at the forge, gun owners and survivors of gun violence, mothers who have lost their children to gun violence, sometimes by suicide, sometimes by homicide, and all gathering together to be at the forge, to use the hammer, to pound, often crying, sometimes screaming, to turn their pain into a tool for peace. It's Shane's vision based on Isaiah's vision which greets us as we step into Advent today. Shane didn't come up with this idea of beating swords into plowshares. We just heard it in Isaiah. 
Weapons are beaten into new tools is a good way to translate it. We are called to see and believe a new vision that shall come to pass. His vision is for Judah and Jerusalem, but it's really for Ohio and Columbus. It's really for America and the world. He offers God's word that in the nation and in the city on the hill, peace shall come to pass. Jerusalem shall become the place where swords are beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. The place where nations will no longer lift up sword against other nations. The place where no one will learn war anymore. But Jerusalem won't be and shouldn't be the only place this happens. Is this just a fantastical vision? Perhaps. But perhaps it is the vision of the way God sees the world, the world which God created in the first place. We could use such a vision in our world, in our nation today. Words would be used for healing, not destroying one another. For example, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all social media would be the place which brings us together rather than creates cruel fever and angst against one another. Maybe we should give up Facebook for Advent and Christmas this year, or at least turn it into a place that is only for kindness and peacemaking, not snarkiness and cruelty, or supporting snarkiness and cruelty with a thumb up, or worse yet, no response at all. Beyond the weapons of words, actual weapons would be laid down. Friendship and healthy relationships rather than terror and fear would become the measure of our society's greatness. The prophet's words may seem like a dream to you and me, but it's not really true. As I walk the streets of Jerusalem in June and many times in the past, I have witnessed the intensity and the power of feeling and faith the people there bring to their everyday existence. I have imagined that the coming of peace is desired intensely by them as all people of faith from different religions. The problem is that each faith tradition cares so deeply about the place and its historic buildings that no one is willing to let go of it. And yet each faith tradition in its efforts to possess and control Jerusalem fails to hold the very gem which they can never truly possess. Similarly, in our nation and in our lives, that which we try to hold on to and possess it often eludes us. Sometimes we hold on to something so tight and seek to make it to be the way we want it to be so much that it should be this way that we strangle it, we smother it with our well-meaning intentions and our self-pride. We discover in so doing that the way things should be can't be. They can never be the way we try to force them to be. We can do this in our jobs. We can do this in our families, in school. We can do it in relationships. We can do it with our beliefs and with our faith. We can do it here at First Church as a church community. Our ideas of what it should be come to play. Perhaps we hold on to a memory, or maybe it's a belief system or a life commandment that we have that can't be let go of. One of the ones that you've heard so often and maybe even used yourself is, we've never done it that way before, as we like to say, the seven last words of the church. <laughs> and then we seek all in our imagination to keep something the way, it, we, the way it is, the way we believe it must be, right? But truthfully, it never was that way to begin with. It never can be and never will be just that way. We do well as we anticipate the unexpected arrival of the baby, of the Messiah, to begin to beat our swords into plowshares, our guns into garden tools, and our images of how things are supposed to be into something that God can actually shape, and not just us. Beauty and true possibilities for life and living become possible when we let go of our shoulds and embrace God's coulds. That alone would mark an unexpected arrival in our hearts and minds. In Matthew 24, we encounter other seemingly violent and unexpected arrivals. There's a flood, there's a kidnapper, a disappeared farmer and a farmer's house, a housewife, it says. A little old text. <laughs> and then the thief of the night, 
They're all very sharp images, intrusive, disturbing images that bring us into a new year of Christian faith and introduce Advent one more time. Just when you think it's safe to bring friends and family back to church for the holidays, the Gospel of Matthew opens up a full frontal assault on warnings about being prepared for Noah's flood. I'd forgotten all about Noah's flood. Or about being suddenly kidnapped while working in a field or a mill or being robbed while sleeping in your home by a break-in robber who takes all you have. Wow, just makes me happy. <laughs> Again, in what way do we welcome family and friends to church for the holidays? Well, let's keep moving. Is it any wonder that people will stay away? Moving to high ground, avoiding kidnapping and protecting their homes with all their Christmas gifts inside, some of which were purchased just 48 hours ago. Our first Christian ancestors, our first century ancestors of faith had a way with words. They wanted us to be sure as the cozy cousins of 2,000 years later that we wouldn't miss the message of the coming of God. God will come suddenly, be prepared, watch out, be awake, wait for God, right? Those are all like shaking kinds of images. Our early forebears in faith wanted us to know what they already knew, that Christianity's filled with the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, of which Hamlet spoke in his famous soliloquy, and Advent is that season in which we're introduced most bluntly to the slings and arrows and their double-edged reality. On one edge is the great good news of God's coming. On the other edge is the cost of discipleship involved in welcoming the newborn Christ. We want good news with no cost. We want Christmas with no advent. We want a baby with no pregnancy, labor, or delivery. And some of us even want a victory over Michigan but failed to stop five touchdowns of more than 45 yards or more. That's 344 yards of offense on five plays. Anyway, we can't just have it come because we want it to come. Life doesn't work that way. In life, you need a defense that stops the run and the pass. Glory certainly doesn't come that way, does it? The coming of God comes with a cost and in the full and sometimes fearful force of daily life. We can't get to glory without working to bring glory home. The late great German pastor, prophet, martyr, and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer delivered these words in an Advent sermon on December 2nd, 1928. He was 22 years old when preaching in Barcelona, Spain. Reverend Miller, if you and I had had this stuff at 22, life would have been simple. <laughs> He's brilliant. Speaking of faith and life in the season of Advent, the young Bonhoeffer writes, celebrating Advent means learning how to wait. Waiting is an art which our impatient age has forgotten. And this is 1928, okay? That's the impatient age he's talking about. The blessedness of waiting is lost on those who cannot wait, and the fulfillment of promise is never theirs. They want quick answers to the deepest questions of life, and they miss the value of those times of anxious waiting, seeking with patient uncertainties until the answers come. They lose the moment when the answers are revealed in dazzling clarity because they're not watching. They're not paying attention. Now, not all can wait, he continues, but those who learn to wait are uneasy about their way of life, they have yet to see a vision of greatness. In the world and in the future, they are patiently expecting to come in fulfillment. The celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in their spirits, those who know themselves to be poor and in need of God's grace, those who are looking forward to something greater to come. Waiting becomes a measure of our conscience, he says, we have to practice self-examination to wait for God, which can be terrifying. Only when we have felt the terror of the matter can we recognize the incomplete kindness, in, excuse me, the incomparable kindness. God comes into the very midst of evil and death 
and God judges the evil in this world, and God judges us and cleanses us and sanctifies us and comes to us with grace. In our waiting and in our self-examination, God's light within each one of us and all those in our lives begins to illumine our path. In her new book, The Light We Carry, Overcoming, the uncertain, overcoming in Uncertain Times, Michelle Obama writes, I believe that each one of us carries a little bit of inner brightness, something entirely unique and individual. It's a flame that's worth protecting. When we are able to recognize our own light, we become empowered to use it. When we learn to foster what's unique in the people around us, we become better able to build compassionate communities and make meaningful change. So carrying the inner brightness of, God's, of God will guide our waiting and will deliver us to the day of an unexpected arrival, a baby in a manger. So we have to be aware. We have to be awake. We have to watch. We have to wait. We have to do the right thing on the way to Christmas. It may be frightening at first, but let not fear hold us in its grip. In God's coming again, we will be given new tools. We'll be given tools to interpret what we thought we already knew. So be ready to receive the new tools which God is offering you now. Amen.